Though largely forgotten in modern times, Indianola, Texas, once stood as a vital port on the Gulf of Mexico. Its origins can be traced back to 1846, when Sam Addison White and William M. Cook established the first settlement known as Indian Point. Positioned at the end of the Chihuahua Trail, a military route connecting San Antonio, Austin, and Chihuahua, Mexico, as well as the road to San Diego, Indianola was destined for rapid growth. Anglo-American landowners quickly surveyed and began selling lots in 1846. By September 1847, a post office had been established. Not far from Indian Point, a small German settlement named Karlshaven had been founded in 1844 by German immigrant Johann Schwartz. Stagecoach service commenced in Indian Point in 1848, solidifying its status as a deep-water port. It swiftly became the primary gateway for European and American immigrants entering western Texas. As Indian Point expanded and merged with Carlshaven, the towns combined their names to become Indianola in February 1849. The city's growth led to a three-mile expansion down the beach to Powderhorn Bayou, where it was selected as the terminus for Charles Morgan's New York-based steamship line. In 1852, Indianola became the seat of Calhoun County, and John Henry Brown established the first newspaper, The Bulletin. Several more newspapers followed, including The Courier, The Times, and The Indianolan. The town officially incorporated in 1853 and established a new city hospital. In 1856 and 1857, two shiploads of camels were brought to Indianola as part of an experiment under the guidance of Secretary of War Jefferson Davis. These camels were intended for use in transporting military supplies across the southwestern United States. By 1860, the bustling port town, which had rapidly become a formidable rival to nearby Port Lavaca, had swelled to over a thousand residents. Despite not relying on the plantation system and having few slaves in their midst, the citizens of Indianola voted overwhelmingly in favor of Texas secession at the outset of the Civil War. Volunteers from Calhoun County joined the ranks of the 3rd Texas Infantry of the Confederate Army. Others from the area enlisted in the Indianola Guards, or the Lavaca Guards, which later became part of Company A of the 6th Texas Infantry. Indianola became a prime target for Union forces and faced bombardment by Union gunboats on October 26, 1862. Following this, the town endured looting and occupation for a month before Union troops withdrew. However, they returned in November 1863 and once again took control of the city, remaining there until 1864. By 1870, Indianola's population had surpassed 2,000, cementing its status as a vital military depot and the second largest port in Texas. Railroad service connecting Indianola to the interior commenced in 1871, further boosting its growth, and by 1875, the population exceeded 5,000 residents. At the height of its prosperity, disaster struck Indianola when it was ravaged by the first hurricane on September 16, 1875, with winds reaching speeds of 110 miles per hour laying waste to the town. Although efforts were made to rebuild, the town never fully recovered from the damage, and its economy suffered. Population began to dwindle, and by 1880, fewer than 2,000 inhabitants remained. A second devastating hurricane struck on August 19, 1886, even more destructive than the first. Following this second calamity, Indianola was left unreconstructed. In 1887, the county seat and post office were relocated to Port Lavaca. The people of Indianola dispersed, with many relocating to Port Lavaca. In 1878, the Southern Pacific Railroad purchased the assets of the Morgan Lines, which had been headquartered in Indianola since the 1850s. In 1887, they reopened the railroad that had been damaged during the war. This development, along with the expansion of other railroads across the state, caused Port Lavaca to shift from a major seaport to a center for fishing. Today, 
Indianola is home to only a little more than 100 residents and is situated in Calhoun County on the Texas Gulf Coast, approximately 10 miles from Port Lavaca along Highway 316. Next ghost town is Layla, Texas. It's situated along the old Route 66 on the northern side of I-40 within Wheeler County, stands as a near-deserted frontier settlement in modern times. Its streets bear witness to the past, with no active businesses, a handful of forsaken and deteriorating structures, and a sparse population. Traveling from Shamrock to Layla on Route 66, travelers of the bygone era were greeted by a weathered rattlesnake's exit sign that loomed in a pasture on the north side of I-40 for many decades. Yet the winds of spring in 2007 toppled this iconic Route 66 landmark. This sign once beckoned motorists to the exit for the Regal Reptile Ranch, an attraction managed by Mike Allred, a showman who featured snake spectacles all along Route 66, with stops in Elk City and Eric, Oklahoma, and Allen Reed, Texas. The final incarnation of the Reptile Ranch found its home in a service station at the Layla exit. The station building eventually migrated to McLean and now forms part of the Red River Steakhouse. Journeying along the northern frontage road leads Route 66 wayfarers to the diminutive enclave of Layla, Texas, a settlement that once thrived as a railroad town. In its inception in 1902, Layla bore the name Story and served as a vital station along the Chicago, Rock Island, and Gulf Railway. By the following year, this modest community boasted a school and a weekly newspaper christened the Wheeler County Texan. That same year, it welcomed a post office, presided over by a postmaster who renamed the town Layla in honor of his wife's sister. While Layla's origins rested upon its abundant subterranean water supply, it struggled to keep stride with the neighboring Shamrock, situated five miles to the east. By 1920, numerous residents and enterprises had relocated to the larger neighboring town. Around the same period, Long Dry Creek surged beyond its banks, prompting the town to shift uphill, approximately half a mile from its original location. The discovery and exploitation of natural gas ushered in renewed prosperity for this agricultural and cattle region during the 1920s and the community commenced another phase of growth. In 1927, the Layla School succumbed to flames. Consequently, construction began on a new brick school building, capacious enough to house students of all grades, reflecting the surge in population. Nevertheless, from the 1930s onward, high school students from Layla journeyed to Shamrock for their education. Layla's fortunes received a fillip with the advent of Route 66, and the town soon boasted a pair of combination gas station and general stores. Nevertheless, it wasn't sufficient. By 1947, Layla's population had dwindled to a mere 50 residents, supported by an elementary school, a church, and a quartet of businesses. In 1992, the Layla School District ceased operations and merged with Shamrock. In the 1970s, the Layla Post Office shuttered its doors. Today, the town remains devoid of operational commerce, although several residences still stand, many of which are forsaken and crumbling. The Layla School endures, graced by a Texas historical marker and an aged church as silent witnesses to the town's yesteryears. Third ghost town in the list is Pumpville, Texas. It rests as a ghost town betwixt Langtree and Dryden in Val Verde County, a vestige of the Old West. This humble settlement was birthed in 1882 when the Southern Pacific Railroad traversed this terrain. Back then, steam locomotives hungered for water to propel them, and this locale became a vital way station along the rail line. Initially, the station bore the moniker Samuels. Deep wells were drilled, piercing the earth's depths to 600 feet, unveiling a source of water, 
a pump house emerged, designed to filter the hard water before it coursed through the veins of the iron horses. As the steam locomotives chucked along, the railroad crew deftly maneuvered the gooseneck arm of a water column over the locomotive's tender, releasing the valve to channel the life-giving liquid into the reservoir within the iron horse's bosom. Southern Pacific also erected a depot a salt shed, dwellings for the foreman and maintenance crew, a water tank, a tool shed, telegraph office, and a haven for the telegrapher. Swiftly, the railroad siding evolved into a hub for goat and sheep ranchers, hailing from the expanse of western Valverde and eastern Terrell counties. Livestock pens and loading chutes emerged under the watchful eye of Ernest P. Bradford, who oversaw the loading of cattle cars. While Pumpville led a tranquil existence in its early days, the iron artery of the railroad fell victim to two daring heists. The initial robbery transpired in 1897, when Black Jack Ketchum plundered the train of $6,000 just west of town. Ketchum eventually met his end at the hangman's noose in Clayton, New Mexico in 1901. A mere two years later, in August 1889, a trio of local bandits assailed a westbound passenger train. When Texas Rangers endeavored to apprehend the culprits, one met his demise, while the remaining two faced trials and convictions. Around 1899, James N. Morgan introduced a post office, presumably within the confines of his own abode, as the Appalachian Samuels had already been claimed by another Texas town, this community assumed the mantle of Pumpville. However, in 1965, a final incident gripped the headlines when Alfredo Hernandez, the infamous caveman bandit, wounded the 67-year-old postmaster Pelham Bradford in the leg during a nighttime robbery. Hernandez would later meet his own injuries and capture in nearby Dryden. In that same year, the Pumpville Mercantile shuttered its doors, and the Baptist Church ceased its congregational gatherings in 1970. At that point, Pumpville had become an utter ghost town. Yet, after a decade and a half, Reverend Paul Ray from Sanderson answered the calls of local ranchers and concerned folks, deciding to revive the church in 1985. They spruced it up with a fresh coat of paint, scrubbed away the years of dust and disuse, and resumed holding services. To this day, visiting pastors and devoted worshipers, some journeying up to 50 miles, gather for these cherished services. Following their spiritual communion, they unite for a hearty potluck feast and engage in jovial games. In Pumpville's modest remnants, you'll still find the church, the school, and a handful of residences, interspersed with dilapidated structures, sheds, and barns slowly succumbing to the relentless march of time. Pumpville is situated at the northern terminus of Farm to Market Road, 1865, a mere 2.2 miles north of U.S. Highway 90, approximately 13.6 miles to the northwest of Langtree. Next is Redford, Texas. It stands today as a farming community, a shadow of its former self, nestled in Presidio County, a land inhabited for untold centuries. The birth of Redford as a settlement can be traced back to around 1876. This region, situated in an area the Spanish once referred to as La Junta de los Rios, had seen the footprints of humanity since the distant Paleo-Indian period, spanning from 8,000 to 6,500 BC. In those ancient days, these intrepid hunter-gatherers eked out their existence by hunting small game and foraging for edible plants in these lands. As the sands of time flowed, roughly around 1500 BC, the domain was graced by corn farming communities of the Cochise culture. By 700 AD, a transformation was underway, and many local inhabitants began adopting a more settled way of life. Inspired by pre-Puebloan cultures like the Mogolon and the Anasazi, the people of La Junta began crafting pottery, constructing jacal dwellings, and forging expansive trade networks. This land beckoned settlement with its abundant water sources, fertile soils, and an abundance of game. Moreover, 
it was strategically situated along an age-old north-south trade route, well-trodden by generations of travelers. By the time the Spanish explorers first set eyes on this region in 1535, it was inhabited by the Patarabue and Jumano peoples. Among these early European visitors were Cabeza de Vaca and his companions, survivors of the ill-fated Panfilo de Narvaez expedition. These intrepid souls traversed the land, becoming the first non-indigenous individuals to bear witness to its wonders. They encountered an array of villages, varying in size, from humble clusters housing just a few families to a thriving settlement boasting over 1,000 souls. This bustling village showcased a complex political structure and a lifestyle rooted in single-story, flat-roofed adobe pit houses. The inhabitants of these lands cultivated bountiful crops of corn, beans, squash, pumpkins, and melons. Some 40 years on, several expeditions passed through La Junta, leaving behind written accounts of the native peoples residing in scattered villages along the Twin Rivers. These chronicles paved the way for a more significant Spanish presence in the region, ushering in livestock and agricultural expertise. La Junta soon evolved into a cultural melting pot where farmers and hunters, nomads and villagers, mingled and shared their respective ways of life. Before long, the Spanish embarked on constructing missions in the area, with the clergy fervently working to convert the indigenous people to Christianity. Among the early missions stood one near the future site of Redford. Perched above the Rio Grande, at the confluence of a small intermittent stream known as Arroyo de la Iglesia, Church Creek, there once thrived a village named Tapacolmes. Nestled on a sizable terrace, an early Spanish mission was erected around the turn of the 17th century. Dubbed the San Pedro de Alcantara de los Tapalcomes, this mission's service to the people was relatively short-lived. By 1725, it was believed that the Tapacolmes had abandoned the Pueblo, driven away by relentless Apache raids. In 1747, Captain Joseph de Idoyaga's expedition to La Junta de los Rios documented the Pueblo's abandonment, with the once sturdy walls of the church now reduced to ruins. Fast forward to 1870, and Tapacolmes experienced a resurgence. Texas Governor Richard Caca implemented a policy to entice settlers to venture across the Mexican border and establish roots in Presidio County. These pioneers were granted 160 acres of land and the gift of American citizenship. They confronted the lingering specter of Apache raids, tamed the wild floodplains, cultivated the soil, introduced herds of goats and cattle, and undertook collective efforts to construct homes, dams, and hand-dug irrigation canals, many of which remain operational to this day. Numerous dams still retain water for irrigation purposes, quenching the thirst of farmlands on both sides of the Rio Grande in the Redford Valley. In 1871, these industrious settlers officially christened their village El Polvo, which translates to the dust in Spanish. Nevertheless, for generations, the indigenous peoples and Mexicans had affectionately dubbed it Vado Rojo, or the Red Crossing, owing to the reddish stone bedrock underlying the Rio Grande and adorning the valley's surrounding hills. The village was thoughtfully arranged, with a central square encircled by interconnected adobe abodes, each opening inward onto the square. However, this particular arrangement appeared to have been abandoned around 1900 as the community gradually spread outwards. It's believed that the fresh-faced settlers of El Polvo took charge of the ruins of the ancient mission and endeavored to restore them for use in church services. This edifice was described as a substantial adobe structure comprising the main chapel and a smaller adjunct, likely serving as a sacristy. The elongated building boasted a generous double-door entrance leading into the main chapel. Within its sacred confines, two imposing adobe altars commanded attention. Yet, as the early 1900s loomed, the building had fallen into such a state of disrepair that it was forsaken, making way for the construction of a new church. In the merry month of May in 1885, 
as Geronimo and other Apache leaders embarked on marauding forays, striking at small settlements across southern New Mexico and venturing into Texas, General George Crook issued a resolute order. Troops were dispatched to guard every major crossing along the Rio Grande border. Consequently, in June of that year, Lieutenant George K. Hunter, in command of troops stationed at Camp Pena, Colorado, and Lieutenant H. F. Kendall, leading the Black Seminole scouts stationed at Neville's Springs, were assigned to patrol the region sandwiched between Presidio del Norte and Presidio de San Vicente. They took it upon themselves to establish Camp Polvo, a stone's throw to the east of El Polvo town. The vigilant Black Seminole scouts scoured the surrounding terrain, ever watchful for any telltale signs of hostile Apache incursions. The 1890s ushered in a series of transformations in the region. The initial years of the decade bore witness to a relentless drought, casting a long shadow over the ranchers' fortunes and, simultaneously, witnessing the burgeoning mining industry's ascendancy in nearby Shafter to the northwest and Terlingua to the east. Consequently, many denizens who once toiled on farms and ranches found gainful employment in the mines. Around this juncture, the U.S. Army commenced a drive to consolidate its frontier garrisons. In 1891, the doors of Fort Davis and Camp Neville, now nestled in the embrace of Big Bend National Park, were firmly shut, leading to the relocation of the Black Seminole Scouts to Camp Polvo, situated alongside the meandering Rio Grande. Fortunately, the drought's unrelenting grip was broken in 1895, heralding a return to ranching with cattle, sheep, and goats dotting the once parched landscape. Fast forward to 1900, and the venerable mission, bearing the scars of time's relentless passage, was so woefully neglected that it was left to crumble. In its stead, the new church of San Jose del Polvo rose majestically in 1914. This church bore a distinctive countenance, distinguished by its off-center stone bell tower crowned with a low hip roof. Subsequently, it too yielded to the winds of change and was succeeded by the modern San Jose Catholic Church built in 1970. However, the erstwhile old church, now under private ownership, proudly holds its ground. During the tumultuous Mexican Revolution from 1910 to 1920, the region bore witness to the chaos spilling over the river as the unrest in Mexico swept through. U.S. military operations in the area saw a considerable uptick. The 1914 Pershing Expedition, a quest to apprehend Pancho Villa, cast its shadow over the region, with nearby Presidio serving as an impromptu landing field for the maiden U.S. aircraft engaged in foreign combat. U.S. cavalry units were strategically stationed along the Rio Grande, including Ruidoso, located 35 miles upstream from Presidio, Camp Fulton in Presidio, and the rejuvenated Camp Polvo in Redford, which had lain dormant for some years but was reactivated between 1916 and 1920. While these events unfolded, the community's trajectory took an interesting turn. In 1911, the settlement received the gift of a post office, positioned some half-mile upstream from the El Polvo River crossing. When the petition for this postal amenity reached the authorities, they had one peculiar request, an English name. The villagers complied, offering up the literal translation of the Spanish name, Red Ford. Curiously, the authorities never inquired whether it should be two separate words. As the year 1914 dawned, the town counted four general stores among its modest amenities, though it never burgeoned into a sprawling metropolis. Come 1934, it played host to roughly 60 denizens and a trio of businesses. Tragically, around 1956, the last vestiges of the aging San Pedro de Alcantara de los Tapalcomes mission succumbed to the ravages of time, prompting county officials to level its crumbling walls all at the landowner's behest. During this dismantling, numerous manos and metetes, tools employed for grinding seeds, nuts, and other plant-based sustenance, were unearthed from the site. 
Fast forward to 1970, and the town had grown, boasting not only a school and a church, but also a clutch of homes and a population tallying 107 souls. In 1979, Lucia Rey de Madrid, a scion of the original settlers and a retired school teacher, breathed new life into her family's store by establishing a school library within its confines. Though the store eventually closed its doors around 1990, it continued its transformation into a library and museum. As the calendar rolled over to 2000, the town was graced by the presence of 132 residents. However, the subsequent decade witnessed a steady decline, with the population dwindling to a mere 89 souls by 2010, a trend underscored by the closure of its post office in 2012. Today, Redford stands as one of the nation's most venerable communities. This predominantly Mexican-American town shares a profound connection with the Mexican town of Mulato, which lies just across the river. More than 90% of its inhabitants can trace their ancestry back to Native American roots. Select portions of the erstwhile El Polvo settlement have earned the prestigious designation of state archaeological landmark. Within its confines, numerous ancient edifices, including the remnants of an adobe cavalry fort and custom station, as well as the venerable Church of San Jose del Polvo, offer splendid opportunities for capturing timeless photographs. Redford's location, approximately 16 miles southeast of Presidio, Texas, unfolds along Farm Road 170. This scenic route follows the Rio Grande as it meanders through the majestic landscapes of both Big Bend Ranch State Park and Big Bend National Park. Next is Roosevelt, a ghost town nestled in Kimball County, was founded back in 1898, and it bore the moniker of none other than Theodore Roosevelt himself. Prior to the town's establishment, this region was traversed by two military roads. During the Spanish-American War, it even played host to a visit by Theodore Roosevelt and his Rough Riders. The town of Roosevelt was brought into existence by the hands of W.B. Wagner in the year 1898. That very same year, a post office was erected, with Alice C.E. Wagner stepping into the role of the inaugural postmistress. The town was christened in honor of the future president of the United States. This modest community assumed the vital role of a shipping hub for feed and essential provisions, catering to the needs of local sheep and goat ranchers. In short order, it became the social nucleus for the ranching families in the surrounding area. Alongside the post office, Roosevelt expanded to encompass a Masonic lodge, places of worship, stores, and even a school. The early 1900s saw the inauguration of Simon Brothers Mercantile by Ben F. Simon, an establishment that stands today and is still managed by the Simon family. This venerable general store has remained remarkably unchanged since its inception providing a wide array of necessities for the neighboring ranchers. Within its walls, a post office remains in operation, continuing to serve the community. The denizens of this locale were known for breeding horses destined for the United States Cavalry, as well as polo ponies that found their way to the national market. Consequently, Roosevelt became a training ground for polo ponies, and in the 1920s the town began hosting spirited polo matches. The 1920s also ushered in a burgeoning era of tourism in the Hill Country region, leading to the establishment of several new businesses, including the Luthringer Hotel. As of 1925, the town was inhabited by a mere 25 residents. Subsequently, the population swelled to around 100, a number that held steady until 1990. Thereafter, a gradual decline ensued, persisting through the ensuing decades. Presently, Roosevelt claims just about a dozen residents as its own. Roosevelt is situated 16 miles west of Junction along Ranch Road 291. Let me spin you a yarn about Shafter, Texas, a dusty old ghost town sitting out yonder at the east end of them Chinati Mountains, about 18 miles north of Presidio. This here town's got a tale as old as the hills, all wrapped up in the silver mining business. It was the very first big mining town to set up shop in West Texas, 
and by golly, it was the only one that struck silver gold. Back in the day, Shafter was a lively place, teeming with round 4,000 folks going about their business. But now, it's quieter than a church mouse, and only a handful of folks call it home. A long spell before Shafter sprouted up by Cibolo Creek, there's reckoning that them Spaniards was poking round looking for precious metals back in the early 1600s. Then, in 1876, a fella named S.B. Buckley rode through them Chinati Mountains and saw lead, silver, and copper, just awaiting to be dug up. Come September 1880, a rancher named John Spencer was heading to Fort Davis down by the Rio Grande, and he stumbled upon a silver-rich vein. Well, he gathered up a sample and trotted it over to Colonel William R. Shafter, commander of the 1st Infantry Regiment at Fort Davis, and had it checked out by them assayers. Turns out, that ore had more silver than a saloon's full of dollars. William Shafter, along with his two army compadres, Lieutenants John L. Bullies and Louis Wilhelmy, started hankering for some land in them parts. They pestered the state of Texas to part with some of their acreage, each going at it solo-like. But between you and me, they had a secret agreement with Spencer to cut him in and share the riches equal-like. They managed to snag themselves four sections of land, about 2560 acres, but they didn't have the coin or the know-how to mine that silver. So, come June 1882, they let a bunch of fellas from San Francisco, California, set up shop on their land. They called themselves the Presidio Mining Company. Them city slickers struck a load of silver worth $45 a ton, and they got to work in the Presidio Mine faster than a snake in a rabbit hole. In the end, them four partners sold their shares to the company, and for their troubles, each one walked away with 5,000 shares of company stock and a one dollars in cold, hard cash. Progress rolled in like a dust storm and they carted in mining contraptions lickety-split, part of the way on them iron horses, then hauling the rest by them freight wagons. The Presidio Mining Company didn't waste no time. They hired more hands and set up their own mill contraption. Mules pulled them wagons loaded with ore from the mines to the Shafter Mill, a good mile's ride. That is, until 1913, when they strung up a tramway. A little community started sprouting round the mines, and they called it Shafter, in honor of the Major. In 1885, they threw open the doors of the post office, and the company built homes for them miners. Folks bought their grub from the company stores, and there was a company dock for when they felt poorly. And as time rolled on, the company even rustled up a clubhouse and a hospital for the miners and their kin. The Sacred Heart of Jesus Catholic Church came to life in 88 and it became the heart of the town's social goings-on. They kept building up that adobe complex for about six years, adding a school and a place for a priest and a gaggle of nuns. Usually, round 300 folks worked for that mining outfit, coming from all sorts of places and backgrounds. Mexicans from both sides of the border and African Americans found themselves a better deal working them mines and plenty stuck around till that Klondike gold rush up in Alaska took hold in 97. Come May of 1890, there was a heap of trouble brewing twixt them Mexican miners and them Anglo mine bigwigs. They had to send in Company D of the Texas Rangers to keep the peace down in the Trans-Pecos. Then, on a hot August night in 90, a ruckus broke out at a dance in Shafter, some private shindig at someone's homestead. Ranger Private John F. Gravis was there, too. When Leeds started flying, Gravis and a handful of others met their maker. Captain Jones and a bunch of rangers rode in, rounded up the suspects, and hightailed it back to Marfa, Texas, with seven hombres in tow, all accused of murder. Three more tried to make a run for the border, but got nabbed. Truth be told, ain't nobody quite sure who swung for Gravis's death. By 1900, Shafter's grown into a proper town, complete with two watering holes, a dance hall, iron forging shops, a church, a school, and four shops to buy your odds and ends. About then, six silver mines were in full swing near Shafter, and they were doing right well. 
pumping out 20,000 tons a year from 1898 to 1913. By the time 1913 rolled around, those trusty mules and wagons were retired, and a tram came chugging in to haul that ore. They also upgraded the mill, tossing out the old 50-ton contraption for a heftier 300-ton beast. Plus, they swapped out that mercury business for some cyanide, and that sure did the trick. Production from 1913 to 1926 jumped to a whopping 84,000 tons. But round them parts, the Mexican Revolution was stirring the pot come 1910, and a bunch of folks were skedaddling up north to Texas. That kicked off a border war, and the U.S. Army set up shop in these parts, including Shafter in 1916. The National Guard took the reins, and them 50 soldiers camped out in Shafter, kept them Mexican bandits from causing trouble round them mines and the town. In 1926, the American Metal Company of Texas swooped in and took over the mine. Things were going smooth till 1931, when silver prices hit rock bottom. The whole operation shut down, leaving 300 families high and dry. Some of them mine folk packed their bags and headed out. But come July 1934, them mines roared back to life, thanks to old Franklin Roosevelt and his New Deal. Shafter saw its heyday in 1940, with as many as 4,000 folks calling it home. But that didn't last long. In 1942, they ran into labor troubles. The ore quality dipped, the silver reserves ran thin, and there was a flood in them mines. So they called it quits. They tore down the gear, salvaged timber from them rooftops, and hightailed it out of there. Over them years, them mines dug deep, going as far as 400 to 700 feet down, and they hit some mighty rich pockets of ore worth as much as 500 dazra of a ton. Found a pinch of gold, too, and they dug up loads of lead. They burrowed nearly 100 miles of tunnels, and between 1883 and 1940, they pulled out a whopping 30,972,286 ,000, ounces of silver. From 27 to 40, they added 11, 809, 163 ounces of silver, 5,406 ounces of gold, and 7,678, 50 ounces of lead to their haul. By 1943, Shafter was a ghost town with about 1,500 folks left, but it still had a dozen businesses. It managed to scrape by by serving them military bases nearby, Marfa Army Airfield and Fort D.A. Russell. But when Marfa Airfield shut its doors in 45 and Fort Russell followed suit the next year, the town was on a one-way trip to Tumbleweed City. Population took a nosedive, and by 49, it was just home to a measly 20 souls. From the 50s to the 70s, folks tried to breathe new life into the Presidio Mine at Shafter, but it was an uphill battle. The original town site got itself a fancy title as the Shafter Historic Mining District and got itself on the National Register of Historic Places in 76. Goldfields Mining stepped in 77 and found more silver hiding underground by 82. Then it changed hands a few times. Rio Grande Mining Company in 94, Silver Standard Resources, Inc. in Aero 1, Arcana Corporation, a bunch of Canadians, took the reins in Aero 8. Things were looking up and the population ticked up a mite, reaching about 57 in 009. They even built a new mine portal and a big old warehouse complex by 2012. But then, silver prices took a nosedive in 2013, and the mine operations got mothballed. These days, Shafter's a quiet spot, home to just a few families with a small crowd of about 11 to 30 folks. You'll find it sitting by Cibolo Creek and U.S. Highway 67, about 18 miles north of Presidio, Texas. Just about eight miles to the northwest of Seminole Canyon State Park, you'll come across the ghost of a town they called Shumla, Texas. It was another one of them stops along the Galveston, Harrisburg, and San Antonio Railroad, and it kicked off its tail in 1882 right alongside them other railroad towns in them parts. A year before that, a whole mess of Chinese and European folks busted their humps to link up the eastern and western ends of America's second transcontinental rail line down in them southern parts. At the start, Shumla was more of a tent town, stretching out for a good mile. 
it was teeming with hundreds of folks, from graders and track layers to bigwigs like crew bosses and engineers. And you can bet your boots it had its fair share of hangers-on, too, like peddlers, whiskey peddlers, gamblers, and ladies looking for a bit of work. One of them railroad engineers, who'd been gallivanting round Eastern Europe, reckoned that the place looked a bit like the countryside near that Ottoman fortress called Shumla over in the Balkans. So they borrowed the name, and Shumla, Texas, came to life. They even had, them, had themselves a fancy ceremony where they joined them tracks from the east and the west with a silver spike on January 12, 1883. Once they laid down them tracks, most folks hightailed it out of there, but Shumla still kept chugging as a water station for them trains. They had a depot, a water tank, and a foreman's house. Some settlers even put down roots around the depot, but Shumla never did get all that big. It snagged itself a post office in 1906, but that was short-lived, shutting its doors just three years later in 1909. The freight station hung on and did its duty on the railroad till the 1930s. After World War II, they set up a gas station, a store, and a little motel on the south side of them tracks to take care of them highway travelers. Them places kept on trucking till the early 70s, and now they're the last bits of that old town left standing. Well, set for them desert critters and creatures, of course. There ain't nothing left of the original town site. About a hundred yards northwest of them old buildings, on the other side of them tracks, the depot got moved long ago, now sitting on a ranch about a mile west of Shumla, used as a barn. That foreman's house didn't stick around either. Over the years, folks have turned up all sorts of relics from them early railroad days round these parts. Chinese coins, opium bottles, shards of teacups, and more. In 1995, an archaeological survey spotted the remnants of a rectangular stone structure about 20 feet wide and 70 feet long, a busted-up oven they used for baking bread, a pile of stones for blacksmith work, and heaps of rocks where them tent sites used to be. All that's left of Shumla now is an old combo motel, gas station, and store, and that's been closed up since the 70s. The tale of Spofford, Texas, begins back in 1882, when the Galveston, Harrisburg, and San Antonio Railroad rolled on through the area, setting the wheels of history in motion. One of the first folks to set up shop was a fella named George Hobbs. He pitched his tent store during the railroad's construction days, peddling supplies to them hard-working laborers. Right on his heels was C.K. Spofford, who came to town and opened up the Spofford Hotel and a store near the railroad depot in the early 1880s. Back then, they called the place Spofford Junction, a nod to Mr. C.K. Spofford himself. Before you knew it, a whole community sprouted up round that hotel and depot, serving as a shipping hub for the ranchers round them parts. Them ranchers were in the business of raising goats, sheep, and cattle. While all this was happening, the railroad kept on laying down tracks, reaching Eagle Pass in 1882 and Langtree in 1883. They even put up a post office in 1884, and by 1890 Spofford was home to about a hundred folks, two saloons, and that Hobbs and Company store. In 1896, they opened a school for 20 young'uns. When they carved up a big old chunk of land in the early 1900s, Spofford started to stretch itself south of the railroad tracks. By 1907, the town had itself a blacksmith shop, a barber shop, a livery stable, and both Methodist and Baptist churches. They even brought the Flickers to town in 1912 with a movie theater, and they got themselves a telephone line, too, serving a community that had swelled to about 200 souls. In 1913, they founded the St. Blaise Catholic Church, and it's still holding services to this day. Now, in 1925, the population dipped down to 100, but come the late 1930s, it perked up to 319. As the main livestock shipping point in Kinney County, the town grew to 373 folks by the mid-1940s, and even became a bona fide incorporated town in 1945. But then, things started taking a turn. The population began to shrink. School consolidation sent the young'uns off to Brackettville, and businesses started locking up their doors. By 1961, there were only 138 folks left, and just a pair of businesses held on. By 1974, the town had dwindled down to 52 souls. Nowadays, there's still a handful of folks and a few homes scattering around the area, but that post office has been closed for a spell, 
and there ain't no open businesses to speak of. However, the Southern Pacific Railroad still rambles on through town, and the St. Blaise Catholic Church is still standing tall, holding services. You'll find Spofford down at the crossroads of State Highway 131 and Farm Road 1572, about 10 miles south of Brackettville. Toya, Texas, the oldest town in Reeves County, was once a bustling hub along the Texas and Pacific Railroad. Today, it's a sparsely populated ghost town, with a collection of abandoned buildings standing as somber reminders of its past. This town's journey began as a trading post for the vast ranches in the area. Its name, Toya, likely derived from an Indian word meaning flowing water, possibly inspired by the presence of artesian springs in the vicinity. The story truly kicked off when a man named W.T. Youngblood arrived in 1879 with his family in a covered wagon carrying a stock of general merchandise. He initially set up a tent store in Toya and ventured out as a peddler, selling goods to the local ranchers. Over time, he saved enough to construct a one-room adobe store, which soon became a central gathering spot for ranchers in the region. The year 1880 saw the Texas and Pacific Railway laying tracks through Reeves County, attracting more settlers. Section houses, a roundhouse, and shops sprung up in Toya as the railroad arrived, and the first train chugged in during 1881, transforming the town's landscape. A post office opened its doors the same year, and the Overland Stage Company began frequent runs to Fort Davis and Fort Stockton, providing vital connections. By October 20th, 1881, Toya was described as a town of tents, saloons, and restaurants, with water being hauled in from Monahans and sold by the barrel. The town quickly became a bustling shipping point for the local ranchers. In 1882, the cattle shipping business and the presence of numerous nearby ranches attracted famed cowboy detective Charles Seringo to the area as he pursued rustlers. During these early days, like many frontier towns, Toya had a wild and unruly side. In 1885, Texas Ranger Captain James T. Gillespie set up a camp for Company E in Toya. On the evening of August 18, 1885, Reeves County Sheriff J.T. Morris, known for his heavy drinking and prior disputes with the captain, arrived in Toya from Pecos, already heavily intoxicated. His apparent purpose was to confront a man named Jep Clayton. Morris, drunk and belligerent, demanded a mule and a buggy from the Texas Rangers, but Captain Gillespie declined the request. Morris responded with insults, asserting his authority over Pecos and Toya. He then headed to the favorite saloon, where he continued drinking and disturbing other patrons. Someone in the saloon contacted the rangers, leading Captain Gillespie to send a team to arrest and disarm Morris without causing harm if possible. The four rangers found Morris inside the saloon, waving his pistol and spewing curses. When Ranger Sergeant Cartwright ordered Morris to surrender and hand over his weapon, Morris fired a shot but missed. In response, he fired a second shot, fatally striking Private Nye while the Rangers returned fire, hitting Morris five times in the chest. Sam Lane, the saloon proprietor, also got caught in the crossfire and sustained leg injuries. Morris clung to life briefly, passing away shortly after being taken to the field hotel. The Rangers buried Private Thomas P. Nye in Toya, although his grave's exact location remains lost to history. As Toya continued to grow, the first public school sprouted in 1894. Initially staffed by one teacher and serving five grades in a one-room building, it quickly expanded to 42 students and two teachers in the following years. In 1896, another gruesome killing shook the saloons of Toya. In September, George A. Bud Fraser, a former Texas Ranger and one-time Reeves County Sheriff, was visiting his family in Toya. For several years prior, he had been locked in a deadly feud with Killin' Jim Miller, a man who had served as the Pecos City Marshal. This feud had already claimed several lives, and when Fraser returned to Texas after losing the sheriff's election in 1894 and spending time in New Mexico, Miller was determined to put an end to it. On the fateful morning of September 14th, while Bud was engrossed in a card game with friends inside a saloon, Miller burst through the door and unleashed both barrels of his firearm, nearly obliterating Fraser's head from his body. Distraught, Bud's sister confronted Miller with a gun, to which he callously retorted, I'll give you what your brother got. I'll shoot you right in the face. Shockingly, James Miller was acquitted of Bud Fraser's murder, his defense claiming that 
he had done no worse than Fraser. However, Miller, a career criminal with a trail of violence and murder behind him, eventually met his rightful end when he was hanged by vigilantes in Ada, Oklahoma, on April 6, 1909. Violence erupted once more on October 25, 1906, when a black man named Slab Pitts was lynched in Toya. Just days prior, Pitts had arrived in town from Roswell, New Mexico, where he had served a 90-day jail term for violating the Edmonds Act, an anti-polygamy law. Curiously, the newspapers of the time didn't mention more than one wife. Instead, they only noted his marriage to a white woman named Eva Pitts. After his release from jail in Roswell, he was run out of town and arrived in Toya with his accomplice, Eva Pitts. However, Toya was undoubtedly the wrong place for Slab and his white wife. In its early days, Toya had prohibited African Americans from residing within the town or a 180-mile radius. Just days after their arrival, a large mob of cowboys descended upon their home at night, yanked Pitts from his bed, and strung him up from the nearest telegraph pole, lynching him for the crime of miscegenation, marrying a white woman. By 1910, Toya had reached its peak population of 1,052, boasting four churches, four stores, two banks, two hotels, two lumber yards, and a drugstore. In 1912, a substantial brick school building was constructed to serve as both an elementary and high school. However, the town gradually lost its shipping business to Toyaval, a new point on the railway closer to the ranches. Despite this, Toya managed to maintain a sizable population for a time, thanks in part to the discovery of shallow oil fields in the area. But when the Great Depression hit, the town's population took a nosedive, dwindling to just 553 by 1930. Despite the decline, Toya incorporated in 1933, and its number of businesses climbed to 20. However, the population continued to shrink over the years. The bank closed in the late 1930s, and the Hart Grocery followed suit in the early 1940s. By 1950, Toya's population had dropped to 409, and by 1980, it had dwindled to a mere 165. Throughout the years, floods and fierce winds took their toll on many of the town's buildings. In April 2004, a torrential storm brought eight inches of rain in just two hours, causing the dike meant to protect the town to give way due to the overwhelming volume of water, resulting in severe flooding of nearly every building in Toya. At some point, the Toya School District merged with the Paco School District. Today, Toya retains a population of around 90 people and still has a functioning post office, but it stands as a mere shadow of its former self. Many of its original buildings have vanished, while most of the remaining ones sit abandoned. You'll find Toya 21 miles southwest of Pecos, Texas, just off Interstate Highway 20. Terlingua, located between Big Bend National Park and Big Bend Ranch State Park in southwest Texas, is one of Texas's most visited ghost towns. The name Terlingua actually refers to a mining district, and it had three different settlements in southwestern Brewster County. The name's origin is still debated, with some suggesting it relates to the three languages spoken in the area, English, Spanish, and Native American, while others think it references the three forks of Terlingua Creek. The first settlement in the area was a Mexican village situated on Terlingua Creek, three miles above its confluence with the Rio Grande. The discovery of cinnabar, from which mercury is extracted, led to the transformation of the region from a quiet village into a mining district. Local indigenous people had known about the cinnabar for a long time, using it for its vibrant red color in body pigment. However, the remoteness of the area, lack of water, and hostile indigenous presence deterred early mining efforts. By the late 1880s, locals began small mining operations, extracting mercury, often referred to as quicksilver at the time, from surface outcroppings of cinnabar ore. Burrow-drawn carts were used to transport the ore to collecting points, where it was manually sorted and then heated in simple furnaces until the mercury condensed into its liquid form. The richness of these surface ores made these primitive methods commercially viable. In 1884, a local named Juan Acosta discovered more cinnabar, which he developed with an investor named Klein. They later sold their claim to a group of Californian investors who established the California Hill claim. However, significant mining operations were delayed until the land was properly surveyed, which happened in the summer of 1898. 
The Marfa and Mariposa Mining Company built the first large furnace in the district around that time. By the turn of the century, Terlingua was known for its rich mercury deposits, with around 1,000 flasks of the liquid metal produced by four major producers. A new town, also named Terlingua, emerged around the Marfa and Mariposa mine, gaining a post office in 1899. Simultaneously, a camp formed around the Chisos mine, which was also referred to as Terlingua. In 1910, when the Marfa and Mariposa mine ceased operations, its post office was relocated to the new Terlingua near the Chisos mine, about 10 miles to the east. The Chisos Mining Company, owned by Howard E. Perry, a Chicago industrialist, played a significant role in the area's mining industry. It became the largest producer in the district and, for a time, the largest mercury producer in the United States. As the Chisos mine flourished, Terlingua's population grew, reaching about 1,000 residents by 1905. The town was divided into two sections, one for Mexicans and the other for Anglos. A mansion built by mine owner Howard Perry in 1906 overlooked the entire camp, though Perry spent little time there. The Chisos Mining Company implemented more industrialized methods as production increased, including the installation of a 20-ton Scott furnace in 1908. During World War I, Increased military demands for mercury marked the company's most successful period. However, by 1936, production started to decline, leading the company to file for bankruptcy on October 1, 1942. It was sold in 1943 to the Texas Railway Equipment Company and operated as the Esperado Mine until the end of World War II in 1945. Afterward, surface installations were sold for salvage. When the mine closed, the majority of the population left Terlingua. It supported a population of around 350 until the late 1940s, after which it entered a period of decline and became a true ghost town. However, tourism breathed new life into the village in the late 1960s and early 1970s, thanks to its proximity to Big Bend National Park. Terlingua grew slowly, reaching a population of about 25 by the mid-1990s. Today, it supports over 250 residents and remains a popular tourist destination, offering activities such as rafting on the Rio Grande, mountain biking, camping, hiking, and motorcycling. Terlingua is also renowned for its annual chili cook-off and was declared the chili capital of the world in 1967. Many of the town's former buildings are now ruins and abandoned mines dot the area. Terlingua is located near the Rio Grande, between the villages of Lajitas and Study Butte, Texas.